Hey guys I'm Yurizi. This story is all about what if Naruto solved the Millennium Puzzle. A boy forgotten and disowned by his family, an ancient secret buried by the sands of time now that he is about to awaken bringing to light ancient secrets and a lost evil, the struggle of the divinities is about to unleash in the ninja lands. Kin the chosen one chosen by fate to be able to save everyone from the return of the shadows and the evil that commands it. Before we proceed with the story, please like and subscribe to this channel if you liked the video and don't forget to check the description for the other works of the author if you liked the story. Let's start. Chapter 11, Reconstruction. Hokage's Office. Upon arrival Naruto waited in the lobby until given the notice, OK Tykes, the new Hokage needs to see me. So I'm sorry, but they won't let you in. Do you want me to leave Dark Magician Girl with you? He asked. OK Anaki, we can wait. Shiro said giving his leg a hug. All right, will you three, four? He said looking at Aika. Will you four behave yourselves while I'm in the meeting? He asked. Yes Anaki. Three of them said. Aika. Naruto asked looking at the nervous redhead. The little girl just ran and hugged his waist, I'll be a good girl. She said. Naruto kneeled and hugged her, okay good, besides if you're lucky. You can have a new set of siblings. Okay. He asked. Aika smiled when she looked back at the others, okay Anaki, promise you will come back soon okay? She asked. I will. Naruto answered before kissing her forehead. Naruto then activated his dual disc and summoned Dark Magician Girl, do you need my services master? She asked. Yes, I'm about to have a meeting and needed you to watch over my siblings again if you don't mind. Naruto answered. Dark Magician Girl smiled and waved it off, it is no burden. By the way, who is this adorable red-headed girl? She asked looking at Aika. Aika immediately ran behind Naruto fearing the apprentice magician, this is Aika-chan, She's my biological sister. I know that's a lot to take in, but I'll explain later. He said before turning to the little girl. Aika-chan, this is Dark Magician Girl. She's like everyone's big sister and she's really nice too. Promise you will do everything she says. He asked. Aika nodded as she went back to sit with the other three children, nice to meet you Aika. I promise I'll take good care of you and keep you entertained. She said offering her hand. Aika smiled as she took it as Naruto went inside to meet the new. Old. Currently active Hokage. Office. Naruto was greeted to the stoic looking man who was looking over a file while his shadow clones did his paperwork. Not a bad idea, the clones absorb memory and pass on experience. They are pretty much good for any task you have in mind. Naruto wondered if the other three knew about this technique. Before he continued with his random thoughts, Tobirama noticed his appearance. You must be Naruto. Hiruzen told me a lot about you. Have a seat. He said. Naruto complied and sat down, you requested my presence. It was not an order, it was acknowledgement. That is correct, from what my successor has told me. You were part of the organization that helped in stopping the invasion. Better yet, you are a high-ranking member. Tobirama explained. That's right, is there anything in particular you want me to disclose? Naruto asked only keeping a good portion hidden as he was unsure of what to make about the NI Daima. For now, I just want to know if you have some form of communication with the leader or can get the word to them. Tobirama said. Naruto paid attention to his demeanor. It was wide open for him to sense and there was no deceit or signs of a hidden agenda. Then again, the NI Daima was also a censor, so as far he knows Tobirama could be working like a bear trap waiting to catch a wild animal. I can, what do I have to gain? Naruto asked. Tobirama expected that, I met with the other Kage and can only stay until tomorrow. From what the Raikage and Mizu Kage told me, that a third party helped them with their own issues. Kumo has developed stronger trade routes and improved security related to seals. Kiri has managed to rebuild itself thanks to the fall of the previous Mizukage and funding from the third party. One of which mentioned an enforcer of some kind helping them. He explained. Okay. Naruto asked. What I'm trying to ask is, are you that very person? Tobirama asked. 
What makes you think that? Naruto asked. The younger Senja brother sighed, someone of great strength, to have surpassed oppression. Hate, fear and loneliness, might be a lot of someone like you. Someone with the will to move on and put others ahead of yourself. The teachings we passed on to Hiruzen when he was as small as those children that follow you. He explained. Naruto scratched the back of his head, then who else than the guy who has to clean everything up? He asked. That's what I thought. Tobirama replied. Naruto sighed, so what? You require my assistance or are trying to get me to shut it down? He asked. The first one, as I can see it took one child with common sense to bring change than an entire military infrastructure only motivated by a sense of greed and arrogance. For now, I see no need to bring down your association. Tobirama answered. So what's the mission? Naruto asked keeping his guard up. For now, I would like you to join my meeting. Hiruzen and I managed to find the evidence and notes you have on why our so noble clans have fallen from grace. Tobirama said lacking respect for the current generation. You sure that's a good idea? If you reveal who I am then those guys are going to be on my ass. Naruto said. Hiruzen told me about your disguise. Do you have it on you? Tobirama asked aware that his identity would cause more harm than good. I lost my mask and my outfit was ripped apart during my transformation. Naruto answered with another sigh. I'll get you an umbu mask and outfit if you would like. Tobirama suggested. It will do. Naruto said as the current Hokage led him to a room with some outfits and other supplies. Council meeting. At the meeting, all shinobi clan heads and civilians in charge of the economy and local order were in attendance. It was a good chance for the civilians hoping to coax the Hokage into letting them go along with their ideas. After all they believed themselves to be the elite. A couple of the shinobi clan heads were hoping to get on his good side and possibly set up marriage contracts with his grand nephew, Nawaki. Although some of them deny the concept of marrying outside of the clan, but a lot of them are willing to risk it with the potential to gain the Mokuton. With that said, Shikaku and Choza sweat dropped at the greedy look in the eyes of their comrades while Hiruzen just wished he had something stronger to smoke. It was kind of a pathetic sight to see. Then again some of the civilians were probably plotting the same now that the Senju line wouldn't die with Tsunade. Hashirama for his part had his head on the table looking like Shikaku during his naps. Sadly for the show Daime, this was not a dream and it didn't help that he learned that Tsunade never attended the meeting giving him the right to become clan head again. With all that out of the way, Tobirama arrived wearing the Hokage robes minus the hat getting an annoyed look from Hashirama and Hiruzen. Tobirama gave them a look that left no room for argument. Behind him was a black-haired umbu with a mask missing markings and looked pretty blank as if it was just been issued. That left the hidden umbu and umbu commander ready to jump in the moment he does anything funny. I apologize for keeping you all waiting, but now that I am here we can begin today's meeting. Tobirama said as the suspicious umbu stood behind him. Hokage-sama, if I may ask. Who is that umbu? I don't recognize him. Asked the commander. He's not an actual member of the umbu. He's someone a few people may recognize. Tobirama answered as the fake umbu nodded and remained silent. Before we start, where are the elders? Inoichi asked wondering where the old crones are knowing they take every chance they get to involve themselves in policy and meetings. My former students Koharu and Homura are under house arrest for questioning. As for Danzo, he's been indisposed and will not be attending any more meetings for reasons I cannot reveal just yet. Tobirama answered getting odd looks from the young man behind him. For the next while, the civilians ranted about demanding justice from Suna as well as suggesting saving money by reducing academy curriculum. In hopes of preventing their children from failing the academy and making them lose their innocence. Denied, if you want an easy life. Go find employment and lying on your back. If your children can't handle being a shinobi then don't make them sign up. Tobirama barked while reminding them of what he did the Harano head who argued with him. The civilians were soon reminded why they are the civilians and the shinobi are the shinobi. Their words mean nothing when the shinobi can kill them within a blink of an eye. What's next on the agenda? Hashirama asked already feeling a headache about replacing kunai practice with how to sell cupcakes or something equally ridiculous. 
Did someone find out that the Akimichi restaurants have been using message? Asked the Fakumbu. Someone has been doing what? Chosa demanded. That's right, I was going to mention that towards the end seeing it was the least problematic. Tobirama said passing a couple of sheets to Chosa. A minute later, oh those bastards are ruining my quality for quantity. Chose barked seeing that some of his non-clan member workers were using things such as message and preservatives to save money. Chosa you can worry about your restaurants later. This meeting is too troublesome as it is. Shikaku said feeling somewhat bad for the guy. He knew about his good friend's love for his restaurant and making food. The love for making food was almost as great as eating it. Anyways, what is everyone waiting for? Why does everyone look excited except for Saru-chan, Big Bones and Lazy? Hashirama asked using the same names he used for Ohiruzen when he was a child and the nicknames for the predecessors of the Nara and Akimichi clans. Before anyone said anything, Tobirama was bombarded with multiple sheets of paper. Thinking it was just regular paperwork, his mood made the room turn ice cold. They were marriage contracts for his nephew Nawaki and he could only assume it was either for his name, whatever fortune Tsunade did not spend or the wild idea of the boy having his brother's Mokuton. With that he took all the papers and put them inside a large orb of water. Then just boiled it a bit until the papers were non-existent. That alone was enough to make both shinobi and civilian's sides back off for a while. I will not tolerate any one of you regardless of status, power, reputation, or anything that makes you relevant if you even demand me to use my own grand nephew to be used like cattle to be served. Tobirama said in a low tone making every contractor nod their head in fear. Now for this next part, this is strictly between the shinobi. Umbu please escort the civilians out of here. He ordered. The umbu did as they were told and forced the civilians to leave. Ignoring their outrage and pleas, Tobirama signaled for the fake umbu to set up a silencing barrier. The umbu returned and secured the area before the Hokage could continue. Now that we have that settled. There are a few internal matters we have to discuss. Tobirama said revealing more of the documents and folders. I believe that's where your friend comes in Hokage-sama. Shikaku asked putting his hypothesis together. That's right, as you know several years ago the red light district was a filthy cesspool full of crime and despite the village's arrogance, it couldn't be cleaned up. Although not because we lacked the skills, but because we lacked the initiative and motivation. The village then decided to ignore since they didn't believe it was a good investment. Tobirama began to explain. Of course, why would the village waste funding when we were still recovering from the Kyubi attack? Hayashi asked thinking that if it didn't involve him or the security of the village then it didn't matter. That is because if one part of the village is in trouble. Then the whole village is need of help. Tobirama responded feeling the arrogance of the current Hyuga clan head. I doubt it, they were nothing but trouble and a stain on the village. Hayashi said. I would have expected that level of arrogance from the Uchiha. Yet a Hyuga with all seeing eyes is too blind to see the bigger picture. Tobirama said making Hayashi fume. However the Hyuga clan head knew better than to argue with the previous Hokage. After all, no matter how much his clan prides their taijutsu and eyes. He was no match for the founders whether it's status or physical power. Regardless, the district managed to clean itself up under the guise of it remaining the same and being filled with organized crime. However that was not the case, it appears they've been leading the police force through anonymous means and often bringing down corrupt shinobi and civilian alike. Tobirama said shocking some of them. Preposterous how could a group of criminals and street rats be helping us? Let alone how do we know they aren't framing out own people? Hayashi asking in disbelief. That was what I believed until Saru Tobi and a few other sources revealed a few actions committed by the Yondai Me including a few things he either turned a blind eye to or remained ignorant towards. One of these events include his own child when he attempted to molest a female academy student. Then had the decency to cover it up claiming that said girl was seducing him only for to say that it was just a rumor he heard. Tobirama explained. And rumors are just information. The little girl was likely guilty. A lot of fangirls do their best to get with some of the noble clans. Tsume claimed while the N.I. Dime sensed negative feelings in her words. It's funny you say that in Yuzuka-san. Because I read a document pertaining your clan and said girl in the incident. 
A letter with evidence and copies of photos regarding your clansmen and your clan denying as well as annulling his marriage to a member outside of the Inuzuka clan shortly after his death. Care to explain? Tobirama asked making Tsume cross her arms and remain silent. Something you want to mention Inuzuka-san? Hashirama asked wondering what his brother dug up. I have nothing worth mentioning. Tsume said in denial. That's alright because I already had a letter sent to your elders. Since the matter has been cleared thanks to the leader of the district, Mercy Rhodes had her wedding rings returned along with a few photos including some from her wedding along with financial retribution. As of now, this is a clan matter and it is out of my hands. Tobirama explained making Tsume growl in annoyance. Although some would agree with the actions her and some of the clan members did. They violated a sacred right of their dead clan member. The elders and other section leaders would chew her ass about this along with anyone who was considered to be a part of it. Never mess with a dead man's marriage, especially if his family is on the line. Maybe Goku and Yuzuka would rest in peace knowing his wife and children are safe. Now that's not all, I was going to mention the message and whatever else is being tampered with the Akimichi food. Tobirama said before being interrupted. Hokage-sama I will bring these criminals to justice and have them hanged by dawn. Cho's exclaimed as he slammed his hand on the table. You're just like your great-grandfather Chosa-san. Hashirama said remembering hanging out with the elderly 12th generation of the Inoshika Cho group who were training their sons and daughters at the time to be the next clan heads. Anyways, now that we have that out of the way and hopefully dealt with. We have a rather disturbing case this time. It involves what was inner clan related matters turned public. Tobirama said pulling out some sheets with the Kanaha Surgeon General stamp on it. What is so problematic that private clan affairs have become public? Hayashi asked with some annoyance. Hyuga-san, this involves your clan. Your defective and illegal seal that you placed on your branch members. Tobirama yelled slamming the diagrams and passing it around for the clan heads to look at in disgust. Hayashi what the hell? Inoichi demanded. So troublesome. Shikaku said in a very low voice where you could hear the disappointment in his voice. Son of a bitch and you thought I was bad. Tsume cursed. What in the world possessed you to let this happen? Choza yelled. Hayashi sneered, I'm a Hyuga and I do whatever I please to ensure my clan's survival. Not only that but I'm keeping the lower status members of my clan in check so they don't overthrow us as well as protecting the bloodline. Not like any of you mongrels would understand. He barked showing more of his arrogance. That's when Hayashi suddenly crashed right through the floor. Everyone turned to see Hashirama in his complete sage mode form. At the bottom you could see a few scared workers looking at the many holes the Hyuga clan head crashed through as the debris piled on top of him. Now who's going to pay for the damages? Tobirama asked. Not it. All the remaining clan members said touching their noses briefly forgetting the angry Hokage. Then suddenly Hashirama jumped down after Hayashi, I'll go get him. Said the fake Umbu as he jumped down. Hokage-sama who was that guy? Inoichi asked. That was his majesty's enforcer. The very top lieutenant of the leader of the red light district. You might see him around seeing as he's going to be assisting our forces. Tobirama said before jumping down after him. That left the council wondering what the current Hokage had gotten them into. Downstairs, Naruto was restraining Hashirama with his chains using all the energy he could to keep the Shodaime from killing Hayashi. Only he would likely need to enter his partial Biju transformation to keep him restrained for good. However he couldn't risk doing that now since he's in a public setting and would need to control it. Shodaime-sama please restrain yourself. Naruto pleaded losing his grip. This bastard destroyed my wife's Fuinjutsu and used it to promote slavery. Not only that, but they could all die from an incurable disease because of it. Give me one reason I should show mercy now of all times. Hashirama yelled as he looked at Hayashi who for once gave a fearful look. Because you are not a monster and you shouldn't let real monsters like the Hyuga turn you into one. Unlike me, you were loved because of your kindness and perception to tell right from wrong. Don't throw all that away because of one man. Naruto yelled making Hashirama stop for a moment. Hayashi started to feel less scared seeing as Hashirama calmed down a bit, explain young man. He requested. I'm not going to berate you for acting childish. 
In fact, I'd probably kill this idiot if I was in your place, but you can't do it because of who you are. You're a hero to many people, an inspiration, the founder of the will of fire. You can't let one bastard who tortured your citizens be the reason everyone sees you as a monster. Naruto explained. Hashirama took a deep breath before deactivating sage mode, all right, but I want this man locked away so he can't hurt any more people. He said pointing to the feeble Hyuga. Tobirama soon arrived, that's what I planned on doing elder brother. He said before approaching Hayashi. Hokage-sama you can't be serious. I'm the clan head of the prestigious Hyuga. An elite clan with powers that. You are filth and you stain the name of your ancestors. To think you Hyuga were once about unity and growing strong together now reduced to arrogant nobles who profit off of slavery. As acting Hokage, you Hayashi Hyuga and your fellow conspirators will be locked away in maximum security prison until a proper trial is held and until then, as member of the Senju clan and close relatives with the Uzumaki clan. I hereby strip your right to use the caged bird seal and will immediately have your branch family brought in for seal removal and given a proper seal to mark them as humans not as cattle. Tobirama proclaimed before the Umbu arrived and picked up the begging clan head. Thank you fake Umbu-san. I didn't think about my actions and I'm glad you were there to stop me. Hashirama said shaking Naruto's hands. Elder brother, I think you remember this young man earlier. Not only is he our rampaging friend from the invasion, but also the enforcer I mentioned. Tobirama said surprising him. How did I know there was something special about you? Hashirama asked with a big grin. The three suddenly turned behind them as more debris fell from the back. Hey I said not it, so the Hyuga is paying for damages. Hashirama said closing his eyes and crossing his arms. Why didn't Hiruzen take the hat back? Tobirama asked pinching the bridge of his nose. I'm too old to put up with this kind of craziness. Hiruzen yelled from the upper floor. At least you got an age where you are old Saru-chan. Hashirama yelled back at his student. Hashirama sensei I'm 69 years old. Please stop calling me that. Hiruzen said. Nope, you're still that child who wanted to become the next god of shinobi. So far that you would always yell out that you would burst into my office with a paper shuriken while my otato was chasing you down. Hashirama said reminiscing the good old days. I don't even know how to respond to that. Naruto said sweat dropping at the story. A couple days later. As Naruto finished his meeting, Tobirama said that he would have charges brought up with Minato over his reckless actions on a later date. As for the other Kage, things were settled and they went through their own selection process as to who deserves the rank of Chunin. More importantly, Kumo and Kiri maintained their alliances with Kanaha thanks to the intervention of His Majesty. Although both Hokages kept Naruto's identity a secret leaving only Iwa. Onaki was disgusted with what Minato tried to pull and although they settled for a non-aggression pact. The marriage contract was annulled despite Kurachuchi's dismay at finding a strong husband for herself. Putting Naruto's potential fangirl and slash or stalker, with Mito's help. Naruto was given some free property courtesy of the Uzumaki clan as an apology for Minato's actions against the orphanage. At least now, Martha has a new home to give to the children and from the looks of it, it's an improvement since it was maintained by a special seal preventing damage and decay. That's the interesting part, apparently Mito herself found out the truth about Naruto's abuse. Although playing the fool, Kushina eventually told the truth along with Arashi who played the superiority card. This earned him a slap to face spinning into the wall like an Inuzuka drill jutsu. Of course Tsunade tried to defend her daughter figure and godson claiming that Naruto was just some runaway who left because of how spoiled he was. Naturally this ended up the worst way possible for Tsunade. Not only to did Mito beat her senselessly, she proceeded to rip out the strength of a hundred seal leaving the sun in wounded with damaged reserves and control. Mito was not done here, not only was she furious at her own granddaughter for abusing a member of their clan and family. She was disgusted by the fact at what she's become. Her innocent granddaughter with hopes and aspirations soon became a dirty woman with terrible vices. Alcohol, gambling, large debts, the only thing that was missing is wild sex and constant one-night stands. Mito knew she was only capable of so much and regretted that Tobirama along with herself didn't discipline her whenever Hashirama tried to cover for her. 
That was when she was a little girl. Now Tsunade is a middle-aged veteran shinobi who shouldn't act like a princess just because of her status and reputation. It was the final straw, before all three of them and Minato. Mito declared that Arashi, Kushina, and Tsunade were all banned from the Uzumaki clan and proceeded with a complex sealing technique stripping Kushina and Arashi of not only their red hair, but their bloodline removing their longevity, high reserves, and stamina practically putting them on the same level as someone in their 40s. Tsunade was not spared either, at her age she was weaker than Koharu and Homura. As she lost even more reserves and longevity, her old age started to appear and affect her health. Too bad for her, Mito was serious and wouldn't back down no matter how depressed the old woman looked. It was also due to her heavy usage of the super strength formula and unhealthy dosage of the strength of a hundred seal that her body looked older than what it was. Mito initially imagined Tsunade to have a few wrinkles and gray hairlines, similar to a middle-aged woman only to find someone as old, maybe older, than Hiruz and Sarutobi. There was an upside to this, Jiraiya would finally leave Tsunade alone now that she wasn't beautiful anymore. With that, Mito left the former Uzumakis with white hair, gray on Tsunade's part, and returned to the Senju estates to help with the politics of the village. Leaving an angry Minato who would want to plan for retribution and possibly vengeance if he's denied that chance. The former Yondaime Hokage refuses to believe that his actions were unjust and will use everything in his power to restore himself back to glory. With Naruto. Seeing as peace has been restored and a new home is on the way. Naruto finally scheduled a time for Tuya's leg operation. Tuya was of course still fearful, but so long as his older brother was there. He would be fine. That was early this morning when they took him away to the operating room. Naruto just sat there in the waiting room while Ika, Shiro, and Minori were sleeping having been awakened early in the morning. Naruto if you keep that look on your face. You might scare away all the ladies. Naruto looked up to see Fonda looking at him with a serious look despite the humor in her words. Naruto tried to smile, if only you knew Doc. He said. Maybe I don't know, but maybe Blair-chan might say something else if she saw that face. Fonda said chuckling and playfully slapping his shoulder. Cheer up Naruto. Tuya's going to be fine within another hour. She added before leaving. Naruto nodded before turning his head to the sleeping kids. It was a cute sight, Shiro lying his head against Naruto's shoulder while Aiko was holding Minori in her arms. He loved these kids to death and can only imagine how much pain Tuya is going to feel when he wakes up. Poor kids, but at least now they don't have to suffer as they did when Gato reigned over Wave Country. For another hour, Naruto just sat there holding still creeping out the few patients and visitors that entered and left. Then suddenly a nurse came out with some of the other people thinking she was going to ask him to leave. Although not his fault since he was just worried for the few people he considered family in this world. Instead, the nurse was asked to let Naruto know about Tuya's condition. Naruto-san, you're Otauto Tuya. His operation has ended and is currently resting. You and your family can wait for him in his room now. The nurse said. Naruto smiled, come on you three wake up. Tuya's surgery is finished. We can see him before he wakes up. He said shaking them. Anaki. Shiro asked. Come on Shiro, I'll carry you. Aika can you help Minori? Naruto asked as he picked up Shiro. Yes Anaki. Aika said as she held Minori's hand and followed Naruto and the nurse. A few minutes later, the nurse opened the door revealing a sleeping Tuya, normally we would wait until the patient woke up, but Dr. Fontaine recommended that you watch over him. She said as she left the siblings alone. Tuya. Minori asked approaching the bed. Tuya was in a deep sleep and couldn't hear them. Minori didn't like the sight since she felt it was unnatural for how her little brother was sleeping. Don't worry Minori. Tuya will wake up in another or so. Naruto said keeping a warm hand on her shoulder. Okay. She said as Naruto offered her a seat on a chair. Are you two still sleepy? Naruto asked Aika and Shiro. A little bit. Shiro said. I'm good Anaki. Aika said. Naruto smiled and just sat back with the three of them. All good things come to those who wait. Meanwhile back with the Hokage. Tobirama stood in the middle of the meeting with the current Jonin senseis. 
the topic was to take a closer look at how the current batch of Genin were doing. With Minato turning a blind eye to everything and academy standards being drastically worse since his death, he had to see which teams are still worthy to make the cut. Hopefully weed out the weaknesses in anyone undeserving of the forward protector. Before him stood the fives Jonin who passed their Genin. Most of which weren't too worried about their students since they already had high beliefs in them. Mostly out of arrogance or laziness while a pair were just a bit nervous about the criticism they would receive. Now that you are all here. We can begin the assessments. First up, Kakashi Hatake of Team 7. Tobirama said from looking at a clipboard. Hokage-sama if I may. Kakashi is always late by about two hours and that's at most. Asuma spoke up. But I am the Hokage. I asked for his presence and yet he is not here. Why is that? Tobirama asked looking at Asuma like he spoke in a foreign language. Be that as it may, it's his tendency unless it's of a high-ranking matter or related to security of the village. Asuma answered. I will give him 15 minutes. Tobirama said. But it takes him a couple hours. 15 minutes or a demotion. Back in my day a promotion was a right and difficult to achieve although easy to lose. With that, he only has 15 minutes left as a Jonin. Tobirama said. Everyone gulped at the tone of his voice. 15 minutes later. He is still tardy. Tobirama said. As I said you won't see him for at least an hour sir. Asuma said. Then I won't see him at all unless it's to drop off his vest. Kakashi Hatake is hereby demoted to Chunin and no longer the sensei of Team 7. Should this team still pass evaluations, then it will be up to me to decide whether to give them a sensei or leave them on the reserves. Tobirama explained stamping a notice of failure on Kakashi's paperwork. Everyone went wide-eyed at the thought. Minato was always giving Kakashi a chance and wouldn't arrive on time unless he felt like it or was threatened. No, this wasn't the Yandai Me, this was the Nai Dai Me. Someone who's had to pick up a blade and use it on someone before they were all old enough to read. Kakashi may be in denial about his sensei's fate as Hokage, but now wasn't a time for jokes. This was the reality of the shinobi and Kakashi was still being childish. Maybe the loss of his vest would be a good wake-up call. Next Kurenai UI of Team 8. Tobirama said as the red-eyed beauty stepped up. Please state the names of your students and experience since their graduation. He requested. Hinata Hyuga, Kiba and Yuzuka, and Shino Aburame, are a tracking squad. We spent nearly the first month on D-ranks per requirement. In this time, Hinata has gained some confidence and Shino has become more sociable yet Kiba has remained more brash and arrogant. Kurenai explained keeping a calm look although the Ni Daime could sense her anxiety. Yes, I also received a notice about Kiba and Yuzuka assaulting a member of the populace along with Sasuke Uchiha and Arashi Namikaze. The last two are Kakashi's case so I won't dwell on them. How did you respond to your students' actions? He asked. I recently spoke with Kiba about it and reprimanded his actions and yet he's continued his rebellious streak. As well as blaming Hinata and Shino for being weak and holding him back. So after a long argument I considered speaking to his mother who was unavailable lately to consider some form of discipline such as temporary probation for his attitude. Kurenai finished. Very well, I would suggest avoiding outside mission if your team becomes one man short or dysfunctional. You are dismissed. Tobirama said letting Kurenai leave. Next is Asuma Sarutobi of Team 10. He said as the chain smoker stepped up without his cigarette in fear of how his father's teacher will react. My team consists of Shikamaru Nara, Ino Yamanaka, and Koji Akimichi, the 16th generation of the Ino Shikacho group. Tobirama nodded as the three clans have worked together in unity for the past years since before the foundation of the village. Of course Shikamaru is lazy and Koji is a bit of a pacifist and Ino is a fangirl. He said. I understand the sloth and the soft-hearted glutton, but what in the world is a fangirl? Tobirama asked once again like a foreigner in a new territory. It's someone who joins the ninja ranks to gain the attention of males who made it big as shinobi. Although, it's likely due to their name and not by the fact they're attractive or have a good personality as my female student is infatuated by the last active loyal Uchiha. Asuma answered. Tobirama gave him a deadpan look at that description that actually became a thing. 
you would get kicked out in a moment's notice and that's if you passed the initial interview. He said. There's no interview to become a ninja. Asuma said. The NI Dime slapped his forehead hearing that, I think I can agree that your current genin just need a small refresher if needed. Although I suspect you need to make sure the boys are motivated while you make the girl realize what a kunoichi is. Back in my day, the 13th generation were all female and they never felt themselves attached to boys. He explained. In summary, to them boys were either troublesome, lacked cooking skills or didn't have enough working neutrons to possess a functional mind. Modern fangirls would have a heart attack seeing what that generation looked like. They were the grandmothers of the previous generation so that was only so long ago. I will, I think the Chunin exams were a good wake-up call. Asuma said. If not, you know what will happen. You are dismissed. Tobirama said giving Asuma some time to think about strategizing his team and making them move forward. He didn't want to be the first sensei to fail a generation of the Inoshikacho. To summarize, Reito and Hayate both explained what has been going on with their own teams leaving the Hokage satisfied with their progress for now. Seeing as it appears, that Kakashi's team has been having the most difficulty being a sensei and leading a team. From the sound of things, Hayate mentioned how Kushina was also a sensei for Team 7 since her son was on the team. Tobirama couldn't argue that point seeing as the surviving Jinchuriki and Fuinjutsu master needed to keep tabs on the current Jinchuriki when it came to his powers. The bad part was Hayate having to be forced to assist in an rank mission where both teams were out of their league. It was thanks to the intervention of Kiri and the Enforcer, that they managed to make it out alive. Along with mentioning the poor teachings of Team 7 seeing as they focused on fancy jutsu with flash and style rather than basics such as control and teamwork. Instead of biting off, they just grabbed onto something with their teeth and refused to let go until results came in. Perhaps he could have all the teams physically evaluated after going through everything. Only time would tell and they only have so much of that resource. With some of the rookies. Although peace was restored, it was not a time to gloat or slack off. Missions came in and out mostly for D-Ranks seeing as the village needed every hand they could get. It was up to the Genin and less busy Chenin to keep the village on its feet at this point much to their displeasure. In some ways it felt rewarding to help their village while others felt that it only hindered their training. With that, some Genin decided to give up their day off to get some training. It was also a good way to let some daily stress out. And, bullseye. Jaden called out hitting one target with several kunai at once. I'm sorry for doubting you Jaden. Bastion said looking at the wooden post in disbelief. Eat your heart out Bastion. Where's your science now? Jaden asked. It's still here, it was a matter of probability supplemented by a matter of perception and proper muscle exercise. If you want I can. Hey I didn't ask for a lecture. Jaden whined as Bastion continued. Meanwhile Chez was sparring with Shino. Although some would argue it would be one-sided. Out of the three smartest minds from this year's graduating class, Bastion would be the only one to correctly guess the victor of this combat. You could already understand who the victor is seeing that the Aburame is skidding against the ground after taking a hit from a minor fire jutsu. Shino your logic has failed you. Chaz said looking at the defeated Aburame. I lost. Why? He asked with Chaz just staring at him. The silence got awkward, were you waiting for me to answer that question? Chez asked pointing to himself. Shino nodded, well Shino, you rely too much on your bugs. You forget that sometimes draining wouldn't be enough especially if someone has a way to cut off their chakra. For example, if you fought that Rock Lee kid, you would would have lost to his speed, strength, and lack of chakra. He explained. So I lost because your fire was too much of a solid defense for my insects. Shino said. That's right. There's nothing wrong with a specialty, but doing one thing all the time is a risk. Chaz said. I would have never taken you for an intellectual type Princeton San. Shino said. Yeah, I learned a lot from a good friend. You can never be too shy to ask for help. Chaz said smiling and scratching the back of his head remembering back to when a certain someone left him a scroll to help practice his fire ninjutsu. Shino nodded, perhaps we can help each other grow stronger. Comrade. He asked. Chez extended his hand and helped the insect user up, 
Sure thing comrade. And a new friendship was forged. Hinata sat with Blair and Alexis seeing as they were the only girls who were serious about being shinobi. That and they were much more kind-hearted and encouraging. Unlike those two fangirls Ino and Sakura who would often just make fun of her and scold her if she was even within 10 feet of Sasuke. So it felt nice being around a positive influence. So how have you been doing Hinata? Alexis asked. Better now, a few D-rank missions here and there, but I've been fine. How have you two been? Hinata asked. Well we've both been doing a lot of D-ranks too. I can't really say when was the last time I had fun or time to train. Alexis answered. Yeah, you know when you put on the forehead protector for the first time. You either feel scared or excited. Blair said. Oh really? Why is that Blair? Alexis asked. Well most people think being a shinobi is fun and games and a chance to earn a good reputation. The fear is people who know what they are doing and know the risks. I think Wave was a good wake-up call and it was reckless of the former Hokage to make us do it. Blair explained. The mission where the missing Ninzabuza attacked. Hinata asked having heard about that event. That's right, it was only thanks to Kiri and that enforcer from from the red light district that we made it out alive. Blair answered making them worry. So how was that? Alexis asked wondering how her friend felt during that experience. I was terrified when it happened. Kakashi and Kushina sensei were both underhanded and they recklessly sent Arashi and Sasuke against Zabuza's apprentice who almost killed the two. The moment the enforcer came in was when the battle was over and he summoned a dragon to destroy Gato's forces. It was all over after. Blair answered. You are very lucky Blair. I don't think I would have the courage to go on a mission like that. Hinata said. Well Hinata, there's nothing wrong with being scared. It just shows that you have a limit and that you still need experience. Blair suggested making her nod. That reminds me, where did you learn that water jutsu Blair? You just summoned water without being near a source. Alexis asked. Blair remained silent for a moment before answering, someone close gave me that jutsu and a few others. She answered. Like your parents? You did say your aunt was a kunoichi. Did they give you a scroll she used? Alexis asked. No, it was someone, someone I care deeply about. Blair answered turning her head away for a moment. The moment she turned her head back, Hinata was red like a Christmas light and Alexis was grinning. Oh how she didn't like that grin or that Christmas light the Hyuga heiress was turning into. Blair are you in love? Alexis teased turning Blair into a Christmas light as well. No. She denied. Yes she internally admitted. Don't be so shy Blair. Alexis said continuing to tease her friend. Eep. Blair has a boyfriend. Hinata squealed as both girls realized her Byakugan. You can't lie to a Hyuga, both girls thought. Care to explain Blair? Alexis asked now interested in what Blair was hiding. I don't have to answer that. Blair said refusing to disclose her personal life. Hinata keep your Byakugan on. Alexis said. Right. Hinata said also interested in Blair's secret. Hinata you traitor. I thought we were friends. Blair said pointing at her accusingly. Friends don't keep secrets from each other Blair. Hinata said. As Blair sighed, Alexis began their little interrogation, do you have a boyfriend? She asked. No. Blair replied. Truth. Hinata answered ignoring Blair's glare. Is it a boy our age? I, don't know. Truth. You don't even know his age? He could 20 for all you know and you're dating him. Alexis asked with wide eyes. Hey could be 10 for all we know. Hinata said. Hinata I think there's a reason why you are not a fangirl. Alexis said feeling disturbed by Hinata's choice of words. I know he's old enough to be a gen in our age. Blair said. Truth. I'm sorry. Hinata said feeling like a pervert for her earlier comment. That's okay Hinata. Now, is he cute? Alexis asked her Christmas light of a friend. I. I. I, yes. Blair whispered the last part. Is it Jaden? Alexis asked making everyone pause. What? She asked. 
You think Jaden is cute? Blair asked. No. Alexis answered. Lie. Hinata said earning a glare. Whose side are you on? Alexis asked. Hinata started poking her fingers and remained silent. Anyways, is it someone in graduating class? Alexis asked. No. Truth. Okay is it someone from another year? He's not a ninja. Blair answered looking nervous. You like a civilian? Alexis asked. Not exactly, it's a long story and I'm not sure if I want to open up about it. Blair answered. You have a lot of anxiety from that thought alone Blair. Hinata pointed out. Alexis decided to be a bit more serious after hearing that, is something wrong Blair? She asked. No, nothing's wrong. It's just a little complicated. Blair answered still thinking about her last confrontation with Naruto. Well what's complicated about it? Alexis asked. It's just been a while since I last saw him. It was, pretty awkward to say the least. Blair said not wanting to explain the whole thing with the transformation. Have you talked to him recently? Hinata asked. No, I was always too busy with D-Ranks and didn't have time to visit him. He was in the hospital after an injury during the invasion. So by the time I visited, he was already checked out and I don't know where he lives. So I can't exactly find him. Blair explained finally giving them some insight. I see, sorry about grilling you on that Blair. Alexis apologized thinking that was enough of the teasing and interrogation. It's alright, I've just been feeling awkward about my last encounter. Blair said and luckily enough Chez, Jaden and Jesse haven't said anything about that even thinking they would get Naruto into trouble if they spoke up. Maybe we should leave it like that for now Alexis. Hinata suggested. Yeah, let's back to training. We've been sitting around for way too long. We're kunoichi, we should be getting strong and not spreading gossip. Alexis replied motivating them to keep getting stronger. With that all three went back to the posts and then prove why the will of fire has not been extinguished. Back at the hospital. Time passed and Naruto was still waiting for his little brother to wake up. Although the surgery was simple thanks to the proper time and research and heavy financial backing. The result was good although there was no guarantee that the patient would be awake and energized immediately after the operation. So as far he knows, they could be here until late at night. Not like he needed to be somewhere, but he was just worried about the kids getting tired and his anxiety of when Tuya would wake up. The youngest child of the group really wants to get his legs working so he can run in the fields with his daughter and maybe get strong himself one day. His thoughts were interrupted as he heard some noises. He carefully moved around making sure the children would remain asleep. He slowly made his way to the Doro and listened in hearing some screaming. What is that? Stay away from me. Get back. Rayoic. Opening the door a little he could see a patient and a nurse stumbling out of the hallway as if they were trying to run. Then suddenly a doctor was tossed towards their direction. Naruto peeked his head and went wide-eyed at the sight of a large suit of armor moving on its own without a helmet followed by several large green insects that walked on their two feet. Closing the door quickly, he proceeded to barricade the door with tables and chairs as he could hear banging on the door. Anaki. Aika asked as she got up and rubbed her eye from fatigue. Aika stay back and protect your siblings. Naruto warned pointing at her to stay back. Anaki you're scaring me. Aika said as she didn't like the face her brother was making. That's when the door started to break every time someone on the other side proceeded to bash on it. Naruto activated his dual disc and inserted his cards making them automatically shuffle. Aika no matter what happens, stay behind me with your siblings. Naruto warned as Shiro and Minori began to wake up from all the noise. That's when the door broke down revealing the headless suit of armor. Aika screamed at the sight while Naruto summoned a monster. Celtic Guardian. Naruto called out summoning the warrior to defend him. Both warriors clashed their swords and proceeded to take the fight outside of the room as Naruto prepared more cards. Anaki what's going on? Minori asked as Shiro shielded her. Shiro, Aika. Keep everyone safe. I need to make sure no one else goes into this room. Naruto said as he formed several shadow clones and dashed outside into the halls. Looking around he saw more creatures appearing the same way he summons his monsters. 
It was insane, there must be a rogue duelist or someone with equivalent abilities out there planning an attack. With that said he proceeded to continue summoning more monsters. Dark Magician Naruto called out summoning one of his most powerful monsters. You called my master? The magician asked. Yes, the clinic is under attack and I need assistance from you and several of our comrades to help me. Naruto answered. I see, I sense dual monsters such as myself in place. I recommend seeking out the other duelist otherwise they could possibly continue summoning more beasts. The magician analyzed. We won't make it easy for you. Both turned to see a zombified man dressed like a noble with a saber on hand. I will deal with master. Summon my apprentice and others. You will need all the help you can get. He said before dashing at the zombie man. Naruto nodded and created more clones and made sure they guarded the perimeter as he began to help patients and doctors escape. All the while summoning more monsters like Gaia the Fierce Knight and Dark Magician Girl. With time, Naruto realized how easy the battle was considering they were all weaker than his strongest. It was not to say his opponent was weaker and much more reckless, it was to say they were focused on assaulting the clinic almost as if they were trying to tire him out or complete some sort of mission. As he helped the patients and doctors to safety, he noticed many copies of the same beasts such as the zombie man and green insects from earlier along with the headless knights rampaging down the halls. Naruto kept his guard up and made sure he didn't waste a single ounce of energy upon fighting, but was still anxious as to who or what was responsible for this attack. That's when he felt his clones disperse, not even bothering to review his clone's memory, he dashed through the halls ignoring the remaining fighting and arrived to see his clones fighting a cloaked figure with impressive taijutsu. Before Naruto could attack the intruder, the cloaked man turned and chuckled. I've been waiting for you. The man said as he took off his cloak revealing a young man with white hair and a ring around his neck carried like a necklace. Get the hell away from my siblings you bastard. Naruto yelled as he ran at the man with his sword on hand only to miss. The man jumped out of the way towards the entryway, that was rude of you. Is this how you treat all of your guests? The man asked. Who are you and what do you want? Naruto demanded keeping his sword on hand. Always one to demand things your majesty. The man said chuckling making Naruto's eyes go wide. Yes I know who you are Naruto. You are the successor the pharaoh ate him after all. He added as he continued to laugh maniacally. Who are you? Naruto asked again. Oh yes I haven't answered your question. How rude of me. I am a thief and a stealer of souls. And I have done terrible things in my quest to possess the millennium items. You do remember the legends, don't you? Whosoever wields all seven millennium items will possess power unimaginable. The intruder explained. Now for my identity, you may call me Bakura and I as I said. I want to collect all seven of the millennium items starting with your puzzle. He said with an evil grin. Naruto clutched the millennium puzzle, I will never let you get your hands on this thing. He argued. That's why, you are going to duel me for it. Bakura said revealing his own bastardized version of the dual disc. Chapter 12, The New Journey. Tuya's Room. Naruto found himself landing a bone-crushing punch on the side of Bakura's head who looked unfazed. Instead the villain smiled and proceeded to grab Naruto's arm and twist it behind him before kicking his back. Naruto quickly turned around and pulled out his batons sending a wave of electricity to him. Bakura jumped up and aimed a kick at Naruto who blocked it and sent him back. Bakura quickly started sliding back avoiding the batons as they were combined into a bow staff. The man laughed as he quickly parried his strikes and struck his arms and kicked Naruto's feet from under him making him fall. This was not Naruto's first rodeo so he quickly got up and started spinning his legs kicking Bakura outside of the room. Naruto dashed at him and aimed for a kick to the face only for it to be smacked away followed by another kick that made impact. Bakura chuckled at the futility of this fight grabbed the leg, slamming the blonde into the wall. Seeing him down, Bakura lifted Naruto up by his shoulder and shoved his face into the hallway walls and ran creating a small trench in the hallways. Naruto had enough and poured Chakra in his feet to keep him in place to backhand Bakura and kick him back down the halls. Bakura quickly stopped with his hands and did a backflip quickly recovering. You are an energetic one aren't you? Bakura asked. And you must be out of your mind if you would think I'd allow you to hurt my family. 
let alone let you take the Millennium Puzzle away from me. Naruto replied slamming his staff down on the floor emitting a heavy amount of electricity. Only a child such as yourself would allow such bonds to weaken you. That is why you should give up any and all hope of defeating me in your current state. Bakura said revealing his own dual disc and summoning that same monster with the fencing sword. That's when Dark Magician and Dark Magician Girl appeared, Master we will deal with the beasts. Buster Blader and Celtic Warrior have already finished off the rest of the monsters and are on their way back here now. He said. Good, I will deal with Bakura. Naruto said preparing a few spells. Bakura laughed once more, at least you are much more of an opponent than the man in the bandages seeking out world order. He said dashing at Naruto who blocked hit first few attack before landing a kick down his head. Not giving the blonde time to recover, Bakura revealed a sword and attempted to stab Naruto. Naruto rolled away and tried to swipe his feet only for the white-haired young man to jump and kick him in the face. Bakura tried to slam his blade down a few times only for Naruto to continue rolling out of the way before hitting him in the chest with the staff then smacking his face a few times before knocking him on his back. Bakura spat out some blood and gave Naruto a feral grin. I see you can handle fighting other children. Now let's see how you end up fighting with the adults. Bakura said cracking his neck. Naruto stretched his arms already feeling the pain trying to take over his body. If Bakura was holding back, then clearly he might need to think of a way out of this. Especially since he's another duelist with a more malicious intention. With that, Naruto disassembled his bow staff and put away in exchange for his sword that was stored in the seal on his upper chest. A fellow swordsman I see. Bakura mocked before striking at Naruto. Naruto managed to hold his own for a while until Bakura started playing dirty and used one of his monsters to attack from behind. By then, Buster Blader made his appearance and stopped the ambush. Although Naruto understood his cards were useful and only wanted to help, he sent the knight to defend his siblings from any other attacks on them. Leaving Bakura and Naruto alone whose fight ended up destroying a good portion of the evacuated clinic. Naruto started using his chains and began to use them as whips and restraints on Bakura. Bakura had to give Naruto some credit on his tactics, although his strength and fancy tricks are not enough to defeat him in this battle. With that, Bakura managed to break free of them and eventually found his own way to counter them. Naruto saw this and started to sweat as his opponent's fighting skills were superior leaving him outmatched. As their swords clashed, Naruto could sense a heavy presence of Kanaha Shinobi making their way to the clinic giving him some hope. Bakura was too late to notice this and was going to plan out his next attack only to take a lightning drill jutsu to the chest embedding him into the wall. Before he had time to recover, he took a giant wave of fire to the face leaving a disgusting burn mark around the side of his face. Growling. He charged Naruto who attempted another fire jutsu only to knock the younger boy down and smash his fist into his face. Not stopping his assault, he continued to pummel Naruto before tossing him aside. Naruto quickly jumped up and blew another wave of fire through his mouth directly at Bakura who avoided it with great agility. Naruto continued to run at Bakura who blocked every attack and was only able to take a large cheek gash from Naruto's sword. Although their fun was soon interrupted by an uninvited guest. The ring around Bakura started turning on its own making it go backwards making Bakura choke and lose focus for a nanosecond. Which was about enough for Naruto break Bakura's nose and send him flying. Naruto quickly gathered his chains together and held Bakura down as Naruto sensed the figures coming. Turning his head he saw Akhnadine with a scroll, Naruto. I sensed that you were in danger. Who is this you are fighting? He asked with urgency in his voice. He says his name is Bakura and that he's a thief after the Millennium Puzzle. Naruto answered keeping his chains tightly around Bakura who was slowly breaking them. Bakura? Naruto keep all your pressure against that man. He is a very dangerous individual from my era. Akhnadine ordered as he spread out his scroll and started going over several enchantments. Sensei, can you hurry it up? I can't hold him much longer. Naruto pleaded. You are working with the traitor then Pharaoh? I guess anyone will do whatever it takes to be a ruler. Bakura said as he was about to break free. Don't listen to him Naruto. He's just trying to get in your head. Akhnadine warned. Should I do anything? Naruto asked. Just keep him restrained. I can't defeat him myself, but I can send him somewhere else. 
The moment I send him away will cancel out the challenge of a duel. Neither of you will be declared a victor and you will still be the sole owner of the Millennium Puzzle. Ochnadine explained as he continued going over his scrolls. I suppose it was an interesting fight, yet you have so much to learn boy. May you consider this a wake-up call. However, the nightmare has yet to end. Bakura said as he felt the ceiling. True to his words, several more of Bakura's monsters appeared and started attack the people around the village. Naruto heard Bakura's sadistic laughter as he could hear the destruction. I hope you are better at dueling monsters than you are at dueling me. For you only had a taste of my power. We will meet again Pharaoh. Bakura said as he disappeared. That should be the end of him for now. Ochnadine wiping some sweat off of his face. It's not over yet. Naruto said as several insects and knights missing their heads appeared. Naruto I suggest using those new ritual karda. I know you have difficulty with it and you don't believe the requirements are fair, but now it's time to put a few of your monsters to be sacrificed for the greater good. Ochnadine suggested. Naruto sighed, I need eight levels worth of monsters. He said. That's when he felt several presences behind him. Naruto turned and saw several of his dual spirits looking at him with brave looks on their faces. He looked around with surprise. Are you guys willing to sacrifice yourselves? There is no guarantee if you'll stay that way. Last time I did this, I almost lost Dark Magician Girl and another one you. Naruto warned with set eyes. Kuraba was the first to go up to him and gave him eyes full of bravery before nodding. Naruto smiled as he placed his hand over the dual spirit's head. Yu-Gi-Oh! Ost, Timmy's theme. All right then. Naruto grabbed two spell cards. I'm going to perform the ritual summon. I need you to count yourselves in and make up two pairs of level eight. He told them. Kuraba nodded and made his strange speaking sounds to tell everyone the plan. Every monster huddled together and talked out who go and who would stay. Within a minute, Beaver Warrior and Feral Imp stood in one spot and on the other, Mystical Elf, Silver Fang and Kuraba stood looking at their master without a hint of fear in their eyes. Okay, I need to return all my current monsters in order to gather enough energy. Naruto said as Ochnadine saw all the spirits of his summoned monsters return to him. Naruto closed his eyes and sat in a Siza position as he concentrated. Within moments, both spots had large glowing circles under them. With all my might, as master of my cards. I beseech your power to defend my home and the innocent from the followers of darkness. Come forth. Black Luster Soldier and the Magician of Black Chaos. Grant me my request as I see myself worthy to summon you. Naruto said as he reopened his eyes as the circles started to spin rapidly. Within moments both spots swallowed the monsters that were on them revealing two brand new monsters before them. Your request is... Accepted. They both said. Perfect, now please. Invoke your power and turn the darkness from light. Naruto ordered. Black Luster Soldier dashed as he began to cut down every enemy monster that stood in his path. Along the way, preventing the deaths of many who were unable to defend themselves from the foreign invaders. Meanwhile, the Black Magician of Chaos took to the skies and started a ritual of his own. Once he was finished, he extended his staff and blasted the village with a beam of light stopping the summoning of any more enemy monsters. In time, the two powerful monsters helped the shinobi forces drive off the enemy and slowly returning peace to the village. End of song. Several days later. Tuya woke up and Naruto was very thankful that none of his brothers or sisters were harmed. All of them were in good health and to maintain that, he had to risk his own life. Just another daily slice of life for Naruto. If it were any other day or situation, he would still put his life on the line to keep his family safe. Today was just another example of that promise. The village managed to avoid too much damage as only a few people were injured, but nothing too serious as no deaths had occurred. The ambush was just a wake-up call for Naruto and everyone else to realize that peace is only temporary. As there is light, there is also darkness. Within that darkness, there are unknown mysteries that are very dangerous and rather life-threatening if no precaution is taken. However with that, Naruto realized he still needed to get stronger. Bakura claimed that he was holding back and just wanted to toy with him to test out the new pharaoh as he called him. 
meaning that Naruto had a long way to go before ever reaching Bakura's level when he decides to return and strike again. This time, he would finish what he started and will keep coming back until he gets his hands on the Millennium Puzzle. Ishizu and Odeon actually came to him later that day and talked about something rather drastic, yet necessary. For the greater good, anything is necessary so long as no one gets hurt. Something he would have to bring up to the next meeting and his family. Council Meeting Tobirama sat in a more decorated council room seeing as a third party related to the party was joining them. The civilians gave them dirty looks while what's left of the shinobi council gave them odd looks. Hayashi was currently incarcerated and has yet to be put under trial, Tsume was having inter-clan issues with her leadership leaving them without a representative, and finally Shikaku fell asleep. Of course this was nothing new, but thanks to Iruka Umino, Tobirama learned the scary big head jutsu. Wake up! Tobirama yelled knocking Shikaku off of his chair. Troublesome. Shikaku muttered. I'm assuming all your predecessors said that at one point or another. Tobirama replied before turning to third party. They were the representatives of the red light district. Naruto was in the middle representing himself as his majesty, although no one, but the association and few people such as Tobirama knew. To his right was Miles, a former shinobi that was unlawfully removed from shinobi status due to the Hyuga kidnapping incident and they used him as a scapegoat since he was descendant of Kumo shinobi. To his left was Buccaneer who represented their militia and law and order within the district. Next to Buccaneer was Chris Mustang, who goes by Madam Christmas in her bar, she pretty much keeps track of businesses and news traffic. Finally next to Miles was a boy around Naruto's age, Valen, to keep it short, he was unlawfully put into a juvenile detention center until he was removed by Naruto and kept track of policing with another group of individuals within the district since the local police force didn't care minus a handful of people. Now, as you all know, it was thanks to your group that the village was saved. Seeing as our Yondaime was just a rookie who got over his head, I believe I should help in restoration of this village. Tobirama started. Hey I know I may be speaking out of my place, but weren't there three old bats on this council from what I heard? Valen pointed out. Two of them under custody and the other was, well I was going to announce this later to prevent panic for now, but... Tobirama sighed. Danzo Shimura has been found murdered along with his secret root foundation. Everyone else involved have had their identities exposed and the lists have been copied and given to the other villages. Tobirama explained getting a raised brow from Naruto. I guess even old age won't stop you from dying like a shinobi. My nephew's fiancé's father knew that well. Madam Christmas said. How are Roy and Riza by the way? Buccaneer asked. The boy is still being himself and the girl is still turned off by his lack of tact. Madam Christmas answered. Anyways, we would like to know more about what your group is up to. Choza said. Can you be more specific? Naruto asked. Choza turned to his friends, one of you guys have anything to say? He asked noticing Shikaku somehow fell asleep again. Inoichi sighed, what my friend is asking, how long has this operation been going on? He asked. Before the big man himself, there was a few pockets of resistance trying to fix the village their own way. It wasn't until a leader united the groups and got rid of the negative effects like drugs and money laundering. Organized crime was dying and got shut down for good in exchange for undercover work. Hell, I heard about a couple of the root guys being operatives just so they could free some kids and reunite with their families. Madam Christmas explained in detail. I heard one of them was doing it so nobody would have their siblings taken away. The same guy sacrificed himself so his brother wouldn't be taken. He was an Aburame too which shocked me since you guys don't show much expression of your emotions. Miles continued for her. Shivi looked up in surprise, was this Torin Aburame by any chance? He asked with a hint of impatience. I don't know, he had black hair and this weird mask covering his eyes. The guy had to kill his partner since he was too far gone. He's probably still getting stitched up after the invasion. Miles answered. Shivi nodded thanking that his stepson was still alive and maintained his emotions and sense of honor. He could only hope there were more who rejected Danzo's way and were in hiding until it was safe for them to return to their families. Anyways, we aren't here to talk about Danzo. 
Stuff like that in his turncoats should already be on file with Hokage-sama. Naruto spoke up. Agreed. Tobirama replied. Anyways, seeing as we need to work together for a better tomorrow. We would like to come to an agreement on a potential partnership. He continued. All options are open for discussion. Miles said. You give us your plans, military, funding, jutsu if any and. A greedy civilian councilman started only to be interrupted. Try again. Naruto said. Surrender your operatives and turn yourselves in. Said another civilian. Try again. Naruto repeated. Perhaps letting the civilians in on this meeting was a bad idea. Choza said. What would you know fat man? Asked another civilian. Fight me. Choza yelled as he flipped over his table and charged at the civilians. Chosen no. Inoichi yelled as he used his body disturbance technique while Shikaka woke up and used shadow position jutsu to hold him down. Let me at him. I can take this dry piece jerky. Choza yelled. Should we do something? Buccaneer asked. I got this. Valen said tossing a few senbon at Choza's pressure points making him fall. He's still conscious, but he won't move until you take those out. He said as the pair lifted up the large Akimichi. Anyways, as mentioned by Choza it seems that the civilians don't know their place. Shivi said ignoring the civilians. Yes, we are not here to make demands. We are here to fix the situation with the village. Starting with our current shinobi system. As I just learned what a fangirl is from Asuma Saru Tobi. Tobirama explained making everyone minus the civilians sigh. What exactly does that have to do with our ranks? There's nothing wrong with them. Argued a civilian. I literally pricked my daughter in the shoulder without her noticing and she immediately screamed about being kidnapped. Inoichi stated. Then clearly she didn't try as a kunoichi. Said the same civilian. Buccaneer you look like you have something to say. Madam Christmas pointed out. Buccaneer cleared his throat before slamming his auto mail hand on the table smashing it. Listen here and listen here good civilians. This is the Shinobi Corp and a former member I understand that things get scary and rather frightening, but this is not a Girl Scout camp. If you want your children to stay pure-minded and stay away from violence, then go to send them to a temple to learn from monks. Rape, murder, loss of limbs, torture, scarring of the mind and body are all good examples of what happens in the Shinobi world. If you can't handle it, then don't bother signing kids up to their deaths. Buccaneer yelled in his commanding voice as he stomped on the table thus destroying it. So much table abuse today. Miles said. And that actually brings up another good point. You're all about keeping pure minds and yet you don't want the brats to learn about anti-rape ninjutsu and techniques because you're afraid of them hearing the words, male reproductive system, and, female reproductive system. So why in the hell do you baby your damn brats and expect all us hard workers to bow and act like you're high and mighty? Do you honestly believe the rest of the world will care if you're rich or have some cheap ass title like, rookie of the year? Bullshit like that will only encourage their deaths. Buccaneer stopped for a moment to pick up one of the closed water bottles. A slash N, I'm not sure how the site reacts to stories that mess with their ratings. So I prefer to keep it at T for teen. They have an M, but they say it better not be M. At least the bottles didn't get destroyed. Valen said as he picked one up from the floor as well. Sounds like my Tosan, but more vulgar. Hashirama said from his spot. How was your father like Shodai Mesama? Shivi asked. My Tosan, Batsuma, was one who believed that death was necessary so long as the clan lived on. So once you died you already became a hero for the current and next generation. Hashirama answered. One of the civilians started to sweat before turning to Tobirama, Hokage-sama, are you really going to allow this troglodyte to speak nonsense about our shinobi forces? They asked. Why would I? He's spot on. I lost my two younger brothers and parents before the Warring States period ended. Do you think I cried and hid my head under a blanket let alone having the chance? Tobirama asked with a challenging stare. Besides this is a shinobi village. You can threaten to go on strike, make petitions and even take your shops out of the village, but in the end you can't fight back. 
your actions can even be considered treacherous. Miles spoke up. Like any of you would dare strike a civilian. Said one smug-looking fat civilian. The next thing he knew, he was lifted up and smacked in the face with the metal saw on Buccaneer's arm. Before he knew it, he was on the ground being kicked a few times before being spat on. The smug civilian looked scared as he waited for the Umbu to arrest Buccaneer only to be left on the floor at his mercy. Where's your arrogance now? Buccaneer asked the whimpering man who crawled back to his seat. And that's why we need to take action instead of just barking. Naruto pointed out as Buccaneer took his seat. That's right, I think you civilians should see what happens when you decide that your status means more than a fist. The one who holds the sword decides who wields the pen. Tobirama said as only a certain few people understood the meaning. There was a time to talk and there was a time when words aren't enough. Especially those who not only talk, but have the power to back up their words. With that, we believe that remedial courses should be suggested. Along with a complete remake of the current standards. These kids are required to learn every major important aspect including teamwork after they graduate. So why bother expecting them to learn it after five nearly six years after graduation by doing chores? Miles asked making the shinobi nod. Back in my day, you had to use simple chore tasks on a job board for the public. You wouldn't believe how many petitions there were back then to force the shinobi corp to make them do their chores. Hashirama spoke up. If a civilian cannot do something as basic as washing their own clothes or walking their own dogs while lacking disability, then their pleas aren't worth our ears. Shivi said pointing out the logic. Wouldn't it be cheaper to hire another civilian seeking out money? Choza asked making the civilians feel stupid as those were the missions that made them feel superior compared to their defenders. That's right, besides I hear there are classes focusing on chakra theory instead of use and knowledge. As interesting as it is, they should just be left as optional classes. I was ashamed to hear that the Kunoichi are forced to pick flowers and it wasn't for something as intriguing as poison or herb collection. Tobirama said as he started having the teachers tested. Those were to teach the girls how to act like ordinary women. Argued one of the civilians. You also want the men to pretend how to shave their beards while you're at it. Naruto asked. You be quiet you sniveling. The civilian was silenced by a shuriken cutting part of their hair in half. Never mind. He said fairfully. Anyways, I'm very sure we had regular classes for that before. Only it feels like we're just training the girls to be high class women instead of warriors. Tobirama said hiding his disgust. How else are they expected to have husbands? Do you think we women should be getting down and dirty and actually do the work? Asked a female civilian. You are a civilian and unless you want to take arms and fight yourself. Then go ahead, otherwise you are useless. Go bark somewhere else. Tobirama said making the civilian stand up. What would you know? You are just some dead corpse among the living. Your ways are over and you are taking away our future. We done great among our yondaime and it was getting better until you get involved. You are just some old decrepit. The woman soon found herself being lifted up by the throat with a chain of water. Listen to me civilian and listen to me good. Tobirama said flaring his key making a lot of people in the room practically melt. I helped establish this village with the ideal of a better tomorrow. Not so spoiled children such as yourselves can flare their money and walk around as if you are royalty. Do not act as if the sacrifice of the children of my brothers in arms are your pain and their achievements are your own. Do not allow your envy and pride let you assume that you are the superiors of every man, woman, and child who wears the symbol of this village proudly. He finished. Please, let me, live. I have, a family. She choked. And most likely a lover if not a call boy somewhere. Or some child who she has to pay to stay quiet so they don't speak out about their birthright. Madam Christmas spoke up. Everyone looked at her oddly, the conversations you hear and strange things you see can lead you to learning about a lot about the darkness of a shinobi village. She finished. There cannot be light without darkness. Naruto said as everyone noticed a strange one-handed seal he was making before letting go dropping the civilian who feebly went back to her seat. At least that table is okay. Miles said. I can just make more. Hashirama said. Seeing this, 
I believe the actions of the civilians along with their arrogance are enough evidence warranting their disbandment until further notice. Tobirama said. Hokage-sama you misunderstand. Our fellow councilwoman was just speaking out her thoughts. She was one to lead instead of speaking. I'm sure a little temper isn't worth warranting our disbandment. Said another civilian who was cursing the actions of the overweight council member and the woman who was almost suffocated for exploding on the NIDIME. I think you misunderstand, it seems your comrades' actions challenge your words and slash or intentions. I believe that in time, perhaps your successors will improve where you all faulted. I can see with a noble clan such as the Hyuga, everyone is guilty of something in one way or another. Perhaps you can use this as a chance to reflect. Tobirama said before signaling the Umbu to escort the civilians out of the council room. I think we have reached a good point for now with education. Seeing as some of you are former shinobi that were removed for unlawful reasons, I suggest we test out several volunteers for the job of assisting in the academy and overlooking Jonin sensei training. Hashirama explained. Like someone like me would be a teacher. Buccaneer chuckled. That's why we won't have you volunteer. Naruto said making the larger man shake his head. I'm sure there's a few hands who are willing to give a hand and fix the system. Valen said remembering a few of their associates doing this out of patriotism. So let's put it up to a vote. All for receiving assistance from the red light district to help in the academy. Tobirama asked. Choza help me. You have big bones, but mine are small and weak. Shikaku stated in his strategic tone to excuse his laziness to move his hand up. Inoichi rolled his eyes as Choza raised Shikaku's hand up, anyone against? Hashirama asked seeing no one raise their hands up after this. Well then that's that. As of today, the red light district will be as an acting representative in assisting the village council and government in general starting with the education of the Shinobi Corp. Tobirama said slamming his gavel. Depending how progress at the academy and Jenin's turn out. We will continue talks for further partnership and consideration of integration. He added getting some claps and nods. You hear that boss? We're finally going to clean up this place. Valen said. I know, but we're not done just yet Valen. Not everyone is going to agree with the change. So keep your eyes peeled. Naruto said keeping his professional voice. Valen nodded before backing off, this meeting is Erbi adjourned. Will His Majesty's representative please follow me for a last minute meeting? Tobirama asked. I will see you later and speak about Oliver's promotion. Naruto said as the rest left the council room and he followed Tobirama to his office. Hokage's office. Tobirama sat behind his desk knowing Naruto wanted to talk about his next step in combating Bukura. From what he understood, the man was from the era where Naruto received his cards in Egypt. Bukura was rather strong and Naruto was only able to keep up because the former was messing around and trying to test his skills. Most likely getting a look at his foe in order to prepare for his future plans. Whatever they may be. Naruto took a deep breath as he collected his thoughts before speaking, I'll be leaving on a training trip. To enhance my abilities and knowledge of my monsters. He told the NI Daima. Tobirama took that in for a moment, not that I disagree with your planning, but won't this affect your organization? They all seem loyal to you even as you revealed your identity to them. He said. I know, but I already have someone along with a few advisors who are willing to watch over things while I'm gone. Naruto reassured. And your works elsewhere? Will they be managed while you're gone? Tobirama asked hoping the young man covered all grounds. They will be fine under new management. I planned ahead and got to work immediately. Naruto answered. And when Toto you plan on leaving and for how long? The NI Daima asked. Within three days for about three years. Naruto answered without missing a beat. And your siblings how will they? Tobirama was interrupted as someone kicked down the door. In all his stupidity a scarecrow barged in while a couple of Umbu were restraining him. From the looks of it. He was glaring daggers at the NI Daima as he just murdered a child's parents. Tobirama only had so few ideas as to why an esteemed Jonin with a respectable title would assume he can just barge in like his actions have no consequences. Okay maybe those first two were a lie. What is this? How dare you intrude on this private meeting? 
Tobirama asked with no sense of patience for stupidity. Your meeting doesn't matter. You forced my sensei to step down and made me look like a fool by stripping me of my rank. Who do you think you are? Kakashi demanded. I'm the leader of your village. With that I expected each and every one of my jonin to answer the call when I gave it. Clearly from your report, you are fixated on reading pornography in public as well as making up ridiculous excuses such as being abducted by space aliens. Do you know how that makes me look in the shinobi world? Clearly not, and seeing this only further proves that you are a liability. Tobirama explained calmly. So what? I'm Kakashi Hatake, do you know why I'm famous? I copied a thousand jutsu. And? And they mean nothing. A senbon to the head is much deadlier than breathing fire from your mouth. I know who you are Hatake, I know your father was an honorable man and died because the shinobi he saved blamed him for the failure of a mission. Those who go against mission regulations may be seen as failures, but those who betray and harm their comrades, have no right be considered shinobi of this village. Tobirama explained showing that if one person goes down then they all might as well. That's why so many retired shinobi had their pension revoked. Naruto spoke up. And you, you should be defending your own father. He raised you and. He left me for my older brother on false beliefs. Why would you encourage further action from a child who attempted to rape a young girl because he thought his title warranted such action? Let alone the man who allows it and destroys someone else's reputation because of it. Naruto asked as he didn't care for any insults aimed at him. And you would just backstab your own father like that? Kakashi asked with great disappointment. As if your opinion matters. You were throttling the life out of a little girl because you got her mad. What exactly warrants you attempting to murder my younger sister? Naruto asked flaring his own key making the umbu jump back as if a fireball was heading towards them. That little bitch was disrespecting my dead comrades. Kakashi yelled as if it mattered. And how does that excuse attempted child murder? Naruto asked showing he cares little for his emotions. Kakashi sneered at the question as it made him look worse, so, he's worse than I thought. Umbu, have Kakashi Hatake escorted to Ibiki and Anko. If he manages to get off with good behavior, I'll consider putting him on the genin reserve. If he's lucky he will still have some career as a genin with the likes of the Namikaze boy and his friends. Tobirama ordered. The umbu jumped, but Kakashi bursted into a cloud of smoke before reappearing behind Tobirama. The man narrowed his eyes as Kakashi formed several hand seals creating a ball of lightning in his hands. Kakashi proceeded to run at him only to be grabbed by a chain that dragged his hand cancelling the attack. I swear I severed that arm of yours. When did you have time to reattach it? Naruto asked as Kakashi fell to the floor. Kakashi growled under his mask as he started making hand seals with one arm only for Tobirama to crush his hand with his foot. Kakashi screamed in pain before Naruto lifted him up and twisted his arm behind his back. Tobirama quickly grabbed a sealing tag from his desk and placed it on Kakashi back before trapping him in a water prison. Naruto let go a second before as Kakashi was trapped and tried to break free to no avail. Tobirama was a master of ninjutsu and Zabuza couldn't hold a candle towards him. This wasn't a fight Kakashi could even hope to win even if he still had his sherry non. With that, an umbu with knowledge of water ninjutsu took Kakashi off the Hokage's hands. Take him away to interrogation as I ordered. If he tries anything, assassination is acceptable. Tobirama ordered. Yes Hokage-sama. Said the team as they freed Kakashi and carefully restrained him. This isn't over. Kakashi yelled as he choked up the water in his lungs. Yes it is. Naruto said as they took Kakashi away. That is going to give me a headache. Is it always like this? Tobirama asked. It takes more than strength and popularity to be Hokage. It's a reason why I could never hope to be one myself. Naruto answered. Anyways, I should work on preparing for my leave. If you may, I need to depart from my friends and family. He said. You are excused and good luck. Tobirama said as he watched Naruto leave. And the grain of sand against the tide leaves in order to one day hold back the tide. You made a good choice in students Saru. Tobirama thought as Naruto prepared for the next step in his journey. The next couple of days later. 
As he said, Naruto explained his training trip and that it would be long and he wouldn't be back for a long time. Naturally it hurt the boys and girls seeing as it was hard to lose someone who took you in and raised you as if they were your family. Naruto taught them all something he learned from Martha, it's not your blood that makes you family, it's love. So with that, Naruto just spent the last couple of days with his siblings and watched them enjoy themselves. He felt tears rolling down his eyes as he saw Tuya slowly but surely walking around with Minori who helped him as they all played in a playground. As he watched the four enjoy themselves, he felt a hand on his shoulder and looked up to see Joey. Hey Ruto. Joey said as Serenity waved from behind him. Hey what brings the two of you here? Naruto asked with a smile. We wanted to see you before you were off. You know Martha's been stirring up a fuss and packing you a big lunch before you take off. Joey said as he sat with Serenity beside him. Yeah, but you guys understand right? After I explained everything. Naruto asked. Every one of the grown-ups understood this and Martha had a harder time accepting this. But she had to realize this was no normal world and it took good people to change it. The only way for evil to win is for good men to do nothing. As much as the elder woman hated it, Naruto was a good man that had to sacrifice himself. She stood strong and kept herself from crying and could only give Naruto her support and wish him luck towards his endeavors. At least Naruto has someone to return to in three years. We do, but it doesn't mean we won't miss you. Three years is like a century for kids like me. Serenity answered. Says the little girl who pleaded for me to not beat up her older brother. Naruto said with a chuckle. Hey round two right here Ruto. Joey said raising his fists. Calm down Joey, not even Crow is at my level. Naruto said waving him off as he remembered taking the older boy in a spar. Crow lost a lot of face with the kids that day. Yeah whatever, maybe I should start training. Crow and I are the older brothers in this story. Joey said with excitement. Sure Joey, I'll take you up on that match. Naruto replied. Please don't hurt my Anaki Naruto. Serenity pleaded. Fine. Naruto responded while Joey looked dumbstruck. Why do you hate Miyamoto? Joey asked with anime tears. I don't hate you, I worry about you. I don't want you picking fights you can't win. Serenity said in a mature tone. You know you should listen to her Joey. Like you've been taking care of her, she'll be taking care of you. At least when Mai doesn't have the patience to do it herself. Naruto chuckled. Joey blushed at the news of him dating Mai Valentine who was about two years older than him. At least now I have someone to call Oni-chan. Serenity said turning her brother into a tomato. Like you're one to talk. Where's your girlfriend Ruto? Joey asked. Naruto opened his mouth before closing it and remembered that he still hasn't spoken to Blair about last time, there is someone I've been thinking about, but I haven't met up with her lately. He said. Oh yeah, weren't you seeing someone before you went off and disappeared on us? Joey asked. Yeah, she was a kunoichi and... Naruto paused for a moment. I thought you hated ninja. What gives? Joey asked as he was confused. Well it was during the invasion. The foreign villagers were in retreat and I was injured and badly hurt so before I knew it, she found me and learned who I was associated with. I got defensive and told her to stay back and I tried to run, but I couldn't bring myself to move. Then she just... Naruto sighed as he couldn't really know how to abridge the next part. Don't tell me she dumped you dude. Joey said. Naruto shook his head, no, she confessed her feelings to me and the next thing I knew. I woke up in the hospital and she hasn't been able to visit me since all ninja were stuck with missions and reconstruction. He continued. Hey, that's not a bad thing Naruto. It means she really likes you, but hasn't had the time to find you. Serenity suggested. Maybe, but I wouldn't know what to say if I did have a chance. Naruto said sadly. That's when he felt a hand on his shoulder, then maybe you should take your chance to listen. He heard a voice say. Blair. Naruto asked in surprise as the young girl nodded. I'm sorry for not talking to you earlier, but I was busy for a while then I heard you checked out so that made it harder to find you. Blair said as she smiled sheepishly. So you do have a girlfriend Ruto. Joey said. Joey I will knock you out. 
Naruto threatened. Come on, we're like brothers. I'm not making fun of you. I'm encouraging you. Joey defended. Naruto raised a brow, I think you're embarrassing him Joey. Serenity whispered. Well excuse me, I'm no love doctor. Joey whispered back. Anyways, we'll be heading off now. I'll see you tomorrow Roto. He said waving. Bye Naruto. Serenity said as she followed Joey. Blair smiled, you have some nice friends. She said. Yeah, anyways, how did you find me Blair? Not that I mind seeing you. Naruto asked. Blair took the open seat next to him, I wanted to catch up and clear up what happened the last time we met. She said with a tint of blush on her cheeks. Oh that? Well all I remember is. Naruto looked down thinking back to what he almost did. I almost hurt you. Then you told me how you felt despite that. He said. Yeah, you know I wasn't in the right mind about my words and you probably don't this, but you saved me once. A few years ago, when I was cornered by some bullies. One of your monsters saved me and I kind of had a schoolgirl crush about the mysterious hero who saved me. Blair said as her blush deepened. I can't remember, but you're welcome. So how does it feel meeting the mystery man now? Naruto asked. I feel surprised, yet complete in a way. It turns out, the mystery hero was an even better person than I thought. Blair answered. So, about what you said? How do you really feel Blair? Naruto asked feeling nervous. I. I really do like you, but, maybe love was a little too fast. I mean we only met recently, but I still feel a strong connection somehow. As if we were meant to have known each other longer than that one time. Or those times you disguise yourself and helped Alexis all those times. She says thanks by the way and, please don't be angry that I told her. Blair squeaked making him chuckle. It's okay Blair, I'm glad she's reunited with her lost brother and got some closure on her father. Naruto said knowing his identity won't matter in a couple of days. Anyways, I wanted to see how you are and how you felt. Blair said. Well, I admit I do feel close to you, but... I have a confession to make and I hope you don't hate me for it. Naruto said. I can handle it. Blair said optimistically. Back in the day, I really didn't like ninjas. In fact I hated them and located them especially after the incident with Joey. Blair looked down as she reached for he forehead protector. But then I was on one of my dragons and saw the academy. I saw you along with Jaden and Jesse. All of you were in perfect synchronicity. It astonished me that you could all work together as a team and yet, you were told it was bad because you were taught to fend for yourselves. Naruto continued. So wait, you were the stranger who gave us the thumbs up back then. Blair said as he nodded. It was odd and just as I started my own training. I kept finding myself coming back and just watched you along with those other three. Naruto said thinking back to his visits. So you've been watching us. Blair said feeling unsure of what to make of it. Seeing you all, I felt envious. I hated ninja and thought they were prideful idiots. But then you six were there, you looked all so happy and determined and full of hope. Sometimes I wished back then that I could join in and make friends my own age. Instead my biological brother was there and worked day and night to ruin that. I always envied Arashi, he got the love, attention, friends, the chance to watch my sister Ika grow while I was cast out and left on my own until the orphanage took me and Naruto finished trying to keep his emotions in. Naruto. Blair was lost for words as she finally understood him. I just wanted an opportunity to have a normal life. Naruto said sadly. But I can't have that. I'm leaving Blair. He added making her gasp. Leaving what? Blair asked. The village. I have some training I need and I won't be back for at least three years. Naruto answered. But why? What about your siblings? Or your friends from earlier? Blair asked as she was confused about this sudden news. I already told them and as much as it pains me. I can't take my siblings with me. So as much as it hurts, I have to leave them under the care of my friends. Naruto answered sadly. There's no way to talk you out of this, is there? Blair asked receiving a head shake. 
Blair looked at the bench seat and noticed how close their hands are, if that's how it is. Then maybe, maybe you can at least promise me something when you come back. She said standing up. Blair. Naruto asked as she pulled him up. Blair started to get watery eyes, you helped me so I want to help you. By at least motivating she said as she wiped her eyes. If you really are going out there and leaving for three years then, don't feel regrets. Don't feel sad or disappointed in yourself. Remember that there are people waiting for you when you come back. We're all counting on you to return. Don't blame yourself if you think something bad is happening. Just know that we're strong in our own right. She explained. Naruto just stayed silent as she continued. And furthermore, never feel that you're alone in this world. Because when you come back you won't have that Joey guy and his sister alone. You have two brother and two sister and friends I want you to meet. Because only then will our circle of friendship be complete. I'll be waiting for you to especially. Blair finished before hugging him. Thank you Blair. Naruto said as he hugged back and felt his own tears. You won't be the only one getting strong Naruto. One day, I'll be a great woman. She proclaimed giving him a bright smile. I know you will. Naruto said before turning to the kids who were ready to end the day. The final day. At the gate, Naruto stood before everyone who's been there for him in his life. From Martha and the boys down to the Ishtar siblings. Before leaving he turned to each and every one one of them starting with Martha. So today's the day, are you sure you will be fine on your own Naruto? Martha asked still worried for her foster son. I will call San. I'll write every chance I get. Naruto answered. Martha smiled before hugging him, it's hard to believe you were that depressed little boy that showed up on my doorstep. Now you are no little boy. You are a man and one with a sense of duty. She said. When you come back, I expect you to act like one and maybe find yourself a girlfriend like Joey. She teased. Hey why is everyone picking on me all of a sudden? Joey whined. Because you make it too easy. Crow chuckled. Why I? Joey sighed as Naruto turned to them. You know, I never expected that I'd make friends in the strangest ways. Naruto said. Yeah you being dropped off by a member of the ninja police force and Joey getting beat up by both you and random ninja. Crow spoke up. Yeah and I'm grateful for it. Not the acts of assault I mean. Naruto said getting a few laughs. Take care of yourself Ruto. I know Martha can't handle it if you got hurt. Joey said. Anaki do you need a tissue? Serenity asked. No, I just have something in my eye. Joey said as he turned around to face away. Let it out Joey. Serenity then passed a tissue to Crow. Serenity you traitor. Crow said as he accepted to tissue. I'll miss you Naruto. You were like a second Anaki to me. Serenity said as she hugged him. And you Serenity, you are one of the bravest people I know. Too bad all the older kids can't handle it. Naruto said before Joey grabbed in him a bone crushing hug. Boys don't cry, but men weep. Joey said holding it in. I'll miss you guys too, but I prefer it if you didn't crush my lungs. Naruto said turning blue. Take care of yourself Otauto. Crow said patting his back. Naruto nodded as he went to the kids, so, it's time guys. I'm going to miss you the most. He told them as they all attached themselves to him. Anaki, I'm going to miss you the most. Aika said as her tears stained his jacket. I know Aika, I'm going to miss you the most. But I promise I'll be back, family always comes back and sticks together. Promise me that you and Serenity will act like the elder sisters of the group. Naruto asked. Aika wiped her tears and nodded, I'm going to protect Shirone, Tuyane, and Minorine with all my life. Just promise you'll come back. I don't want to lose you. She said. Naruto kissed her forehead, family runs deeper than blood Aika. I'll always be back. He told her before turning to the rest. Anaki, I know you have to be stronger and that you will be back, but why does it still hurt? Minori asked. That's because you feel like you're losing someone Minori. You just have that fear and it's something you have to cope with. No matter what, I'll always be close to you and the other kids. 
Do you think you can be brave for me like you've been for Tuya? Naruto asked. Minori looked at Tuya who nodded, I think I can Anaki. She said before giving him one more hug. Shiro, Tuya, I know that I left the girls in charge, but can you also promise to be strong for me? Naruto asked them. Yeah, I'm going to keep Minori Oni safe like she does for me. Ika too. Tuya said with confidence. Well I'm going to protect everyone so no one has to sacrifice themselves and get hurt. Shiro promised. Naruto smiled at their confidence and pulled the two for one last hug, good, because while I'm gone. I need the two of you to be the heroes okay? Mito Obasan says she wants to help, but I want everyone to look up to you and become the reliable ones. He told them. Bye Anaki, we'll miss you. Shiro said wiping his tears. I'll miss you guys too. Don't be sad, goodbyes aren't forever or the end. They mean, I'll miss you until we meet again. So don't think of this as permanent. Naruto said as he turned to the Ishtars. I know we just met, but I hope you stay safe out there. The world will literally end if you don't come back. No pressure. Merrick said. I didn't need to foretell the future to know you would say something ridiculous like that Otauto. Ishiza said. Anyways, seeing as you are taking this chance as a way to grow stronger. Then I suppose you will need these. She gestured for Odian to open another briefcase. The Egyptian god cards, Slifer the Sky Dragon and the Winged Dragon of R.A. Both very powerful and can match and in some case, outdo obelisk depending on how you use them. Odian said as Naruto felt their hostility aimed at him as obelisk once felt. Naruto nodded as they closed the suitcase and handed it to him, Thank you, will this be all or will I need any words of wisdom before I leave? He asked. Just one thing. I suppose you will need something to help motivate you or at least give you some insight on what to prepare for. Ishiza said taking off her necklace and handing it to Naruto. The Millennium Necklace, why are you handing it to me? Wouldn't it be safer with you? Naruto asked. It is meant for your use my pharaoh. Not only that, but the Millennium Rod as well. Ishizu answered as Merrick revealed the Millennium Rod and handed it to Naruto. I see. I guess I best get to learning how to use these things, but what will you three do for now? Naruto asked. Until the moment of climax comes, our job is officially done here for now. Merrick answered. Perhaps we will travel the nations and see where the wind takes us. Odian added. I understand, I wish you luck on your own journey as well. Naruto said keeping the two items in a ceiling scroll. With that he stood right outside the gates and looked back at everyone. I thank you all for everything and most especially, the happy memories. I only hope we make even more memories when I return. I can't express how grateful I am for meeting you all. Although our roads depart here, nothing will forestall my return. Naruto said as he saw all of them wave for him. Naruto then began to walk down the road for about a half hour until he was out of the forest. He then stopped and felt a signature making his way to him. Naruto narrowed his eyes and stared at the shrubbery that. You can come out now. I know you're there. Naruto said. Then suddenly Blair popped out wearing her old hat from back in the day. Hi Naruto, I wanted to tell you goodbye when you were alone. I didn't want to interrupt the scene back there at the gate. She explained herself as she bowed. Naruto chuckled, don't tell me you miss already Blair-chan. He said crossing his arms. Blair blushed as she made her way towards him with her hands behind her back, well I did end. I also wanted to say thanks. For helping me in the exams even if the former Hokage disqualified me. She said. That can't be all is it? I'm a censor you know. He said making her turn into a tomato. Okay, you got me. I wanted to give you this as well. Blair said revealing a small gift box that was small enough to fit in her hands. What is it? Naruto asked accepting it. Blair pouted, really that's the thing you say to a girl. She said. Naruto sweat dropped, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be ungrateful. He said. Blair smiled, consider it a thank you gift since I can't wrap the other gift for you. She said. What is it? Naruto asked. Her answer was not met with words, but rather with action. Blair stood on her toes to grow an inch taller. 
Before Naruto realized it, their lips met for a second until she pulled out. Maybe I was a bit too afraid to tell you how I really feel. She said poking her fingers nervously. Naruto shook it off before hugging Blair, is it too early to ask for a date for when I come back? He asked. No, I'll wait for you. I know all my friends want to meet you properly instead of just random moments that involve you getting into fights. Blair teased. Naruto nodded, thank you Blair Flanagan, you were one of the real friends I had outside of the orphanage in my family. He said before leaving. Goodbye Naruto. She said waving to him. Goodbye. He replied as he followed wherever the Millennium Puzzle would take him. Only then can Naruto decide his own fate for he had many people to protect after all. It's the reason why he was so strong after all. That's it for part 6. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.